On this channel, we've seen several examples of the Quran borrowing from mystical traditions. In this video, we're going to look at some more. In order to do this, we need to navigate through some very complex texts and ideas surrounding Ezekiel's Merkava vision. Let's begin with some basic terms and definitions. In our context, Merkava refers to God's throne that Ezekiel saw in his visions. Ezekiel 1 will be the chapter of our focus for this video. Chayot is a Hebrew word that refers to the living creatures that carry the throne. Merkava, or celestial ox, refers to one specific aspect of these creatures that takes on a life of its own, as we'll see. By the way, Hebrew grammar requires pronouncing the B as a V, so we say Merkava. We're going to approach this topic by asking some general questions. When we answer these questions, we'll have the requisite knowledge to understand some otherwise enigmatic verses in the Quran. And here they are. How did Ezekiel's vision get conflated with some other events in Exodus? Was the sin of the golden calf forgiven? How could the Israelites worship an idol? Why was the proposed answer to how the sin happened silenced? How did these traditions reemerge? And what does this mean for the dating of later traditions? What are the two visions? What is the importance of dust and footprints? And what does this have to do with the Quran? If this is not the strangest set of questions you've ever read, then you need to stop reading such weird stuff. So, let's get to the first question. How did Ezekiel's vision get conflated with other events in Exodus? Well, look at early rabbinic commentary. What do you see? Very frequently, these rabbis will connect several passages together, and they'll do this on the basis of a single word, and it doesn't matter what the context is. Let's look at an example. Ezekiel 1 describes, in part, a calf as well as the face of an ox. Of course, Exodus 32, as we all know, refers to the golden calf, and Psalm 106 refers back to the latter with contempt, calling it an ox. Of course, what these all have in common is their bovine features. Because of these common features, the rabbis conflated the Merkava vision in Ezekiel with other events in the Exodus, including the episode of the golden calf. We'll see what this looked like later on, but for now, our first question has been answered at least well enough to move on to the next question. Was this terrible sin of the golden calf forgiven? Let's look at a proposed answer, beginning with a homily preserved in Leviticus Rabbah. This is referring to Ezekiel 29, 16. There shall no more be anything that brings the iniquity of the house of Israel into remembrance. It is written, the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot, referring to Ezekiel 1, 7. And it is written, they made themselves a molten calf, Exodus 32, 8. The purpose? There shall no more be anything that brings the iniquity of the house of Israel into remembrance. There are some other similar examples from about the third century. We'll look at one more and then explain what's going on. Ezekiel sought mercy for it, and it was changed to that of a cherub. He said before him, Lord of the world, shall the prosecuting attorney turn into the defense attorney? We've just read something about Ezekiel, a prosecuting attorney, and prohibitions against things serving as a reminder of Israel's iniquity. Makes sense, right? Of course, this iniquity is associated with an ox and the golden calf. Now, David Halperin believes that these traditions were publicly expounded in the synagogues. Whether that's true or not, these examples show that the rabbis, in some way, openly discussed and condemned the connection between the Merkava ox and the golden calf. And anything that was a reminder of the golden calf incident was taboo, like the face of an ox, or in other sources, the gold of the priest's robes. These things were prosecuting attorneys because they bore witness to Israel's idolatrous sin. And these sources describe the rabbis dealing with the question of, was Israel forgiven? And they were. Now, we're on to the third and fourth questions. Let's think back to Exodus for a minute. The Israelites have been rescued from Egypt. There's Sinai in Exodus 19, followed by the Ten Commandments. We have the conquest of Canaan being promised, the confirmation of the covenant in Exodus 24, and so on. Things are looking good. But then, in Exodus 32, the people are worshiping a golden calf. How could the Israelites worship an idol after all that had happened? When we look for an answer given sometime around the 2nd or 3rd century, silence descends. Rabbi Papias expounded they exchanged their glory for the likeness of an ox that eats grass. I think that this refers to the celestial ox. Therefore, Scripture says that eats grass. 
Rabbi Akiva said to him, Enough, Papias. How could this idolatry happen? Worshipping a simple idol? The answer to our third question is, it wasn't just an idol. It was the celestial ox, also called the exalted chayot or the holy chayot elsewhere. The likeness of the bovine idol the Israelites worshipped was nothing less than that of Ezekiel's vision, which, as we've seen, was also present elsewhere in Exodus. The idolatry then was somehow associated with a bearer of God's throne. That's a major problem. In case you haven't picked up on it yet, what these sources have suggested and will continue to suggest is that the source of the idolatry was God. Good and evil in God had become ambiguous. This is very disturbing theology. Regarding our fourth question, we can easily see why the answer was silenced. As Rabbi Akiva said, enough. By the way, it would be sloppy of me not to mention a somewhat similar ambiguity in the Islamic sources. In the Quran, Allah's throne was over water before creation, and according to Muhammad in the Hadith, both Allah's and Satan's thrones are over water. Muslims, you can figure that out for yourselves, but for those of you who are open to an explanation from the mystical background, we've alluded to this in prior videos. We're going to talk about it a lot more in the future, but we'll have to postpone that discussion for now. Question five, how did these traditions reemerge, and what does this mean for the dating of later traditions? As generations of silence passed, the old expositions emerged from eclipse. In a commentary on the Song of Songs, 1-9, we can watch them coming out of the shadow and entering the later Midrashic collections. We may thus reasonably look to these late collections for early Midrash, setting forth what the second or third century dialogues regarded as the dreadful secret of the Merkavah. What comes later illuminates what came before it. Let's look at an example of how this happens, and in doing so, we'll answer our sixth question about the two visions. Exodus 3, 7 says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen, O Ra'iti, the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. The Hebrew idiom translated, I have surely seen, could literally be translated, seeing I have seen and it gave rise to more rabbinic speculation, this time about two visions. Let's go to Exodus Rabbah, where this development takes an important turn. This is God speaking. You see them now, vision one, as idol worshippers, but I see them, vision two, as they go forth from Egypt. I will split the sea for them and bring them into the desert, and I will give them my Torah and show them my glory face to face, and they will accept my rulership, and after forty days will rebel against me and make the calf. This is what the scripture says. I have surely seen the affliction of my people, referring to Exodus 3, 7. This refers to the sound of the calf. I hear the sound of affliction. And in another example, I, God, will be going forth in my carriage, and they will detach one of my team and anger me with it. Now we know what the two visions are all about. God saw the idolatry coming. Moses didn't. They both saw different things. There's also another important development. Here the Israelites didn't make an image of the creature they worshipped, but they detached it from God's throne chariot. The calf was alive. We're almost finished our survey. Now let's fast forward to some post-Quranic sources. We're going to look at two Genizah texts where we'll see further development of these same ideas and that they also have pre-Quranic roots. We will also see that the traditions they preserve are conspicuously Jewish in nature. We're about to find out the importance of dust and footprints. Notice in these texts, the Merkava and Chayot are placed at the Red Sea. That's a bit different. Fragment 1, the reconstructions are indicated in angle brackets. God replied, Do I not know? It is I who know best. It was my own soul that induced me. When they crossed the Red Sea, I decided to show them my chariots. When they crossed, they saw my chariots carried by four rulers of the world human, lion, eagle, and ox. The ox was walking on the left. After they had crossed, they hurriedly took dust from under the feet of the ox. Thus it is written, and out came this calf, which shows that the ox emerged in their presence. The second fragment reads similarly. When God revealed himself at the sea, his Merkavah had the likeness of Chayot carved in it. When the Israelites saw the likeness of an ox traveling on the left, they took dust from under its feet. When they made the calf, they took this dust and threw it in. 
with the result that the calf stamped. There's also a report from a 15th century German mystic named Manaheim Seuni of a now lost midrash on the Song of Songs 612. He took some of the dust that was underneath the ox element, translation questionable, and kept it with them until the appropriate time. Who is the he who took some of the dust from under the ox? We'll save that for another video. We have now finished tracing the development of these stories about the Merkavah and Exodus. Congratulations, you made it. Let's look at our last two questions. What is the importance of dust and footprints, and what does this have to do with the Quran? Surah 2096 sounds very similar to what we just read. I took a handful of dust from the footprint of the messenger. Could this verse, which the Quran places in the context of the calf episode, be a variant of a similar story that we see placed at the Red Sea in the Ginnazah fragments? I believe it is. But is there anything pre-Quranic that talks about this curious element of the dust and the footprints? Let's go to the Talmud. Another teaching of Rabbi Hanina, there is no other besides him, Deuteronomy 4.35. Not even sorcerers can contend with God. A certain woman tried to take dust from beneath the feet of Rabbi Hanina to cast a spell over him to kill him. So what is it about the dust and the footprints? It refers to the belief that you can get control over another person or creature by using the dust of its footprints. Muslims, do you believe in that? Your God does. That's how he says the calf was created in Surah 2096. Now, let's go back to the Quran again as we finish up. For our purposes, we'll look at Surah 20. Note that this Surah mentions by name a figure we won't discuss in this video, al Samri, taken by many to be the Samaritan. He's the villain who is named in Surah 20, unlike the parallel story in Surah 7. There are other differences between the accounts readers should be aware of, but unfortunately they can't delay us here. Then he brought forth for them a calf, a mere image of it, having a mooing sound. And they said, this is your God, and the God of Moses, though he has forgotten. And we've already seen Surah 2096. He said, I saw what they did not see, and I took a handful of dust from the footprint of the messenger, and I tossed it. In this way, my mind contrived it for me. Now let's plug in what we've learned piece by piece. I'm just going to leave the text up on the screen so we can concentrate on putting the pieces together. Surah 2088. Then he, the person we'll do a video about later, brought forth for them a calf. What was the calf? Depending on which one of the traditions that the Quran is borrowing from, it's either the Merkavah ox itself or an image of it, as the next phrase would indicate. But the lemma, jasad, and its root occur four times in the Quran. I have three of them up for you. In addition to Surah 2088, there's 38, 34, and 21, 8. 7148 also, but we're not going to talk about that because it's a parallel to 2088. We've seen in a previous video that the background for Surah 3834 is the story of Solomon and Ashmedai, the king of the demons, and Ashmedai was anything but a mere image. So that makes the translation questionable for Surah 3834. In Surah 218, the term simply refers to a normal body, and back to our verses, the calf is clearly alive in the Quran. In the other two places, the word occurs. The calf moves. It walks. That's why you can gather dust from its footprints in verse 96. So I'm going to argue against the translation image in Surah 20 and Surah 7. I think that's reading Exodus too much into the Quran. Back to Surah 2088. The calf had a mooing sound. <coughs> That's a quick comedy break for those of you who have made it this far. Good job. Why did the calf moo? We've seen why the calf mooed. According to the rabbis, the affliction that Moses and Joshua heard was the afflicted cry, not of the people, but of the calf. Remember, that's the sound of affliction in Exodus 32:18, And this is connected to one of them being detached from the carriage. Now we're going to talk about something very odd, like we have been the entire video. What does detaching have to do with the sound of affliction? David Halperin says, If this process of detaching involves the tearing apart of a fourfold whole, i.e. a psychic entity, we may imagine that it would involve pain for the members being separated. This is perhaps why some Midrashim say that the calf lowed, which I assume to be an expression of anguish, the sound of affliction, mentioned in Exodus 32.18. It's difficult to tell what these people thought was happening, in the psychic realm, but that seems to be as good a guess as any. Back to Surah 2096, the handful of dust from the footprint. We've already discussed this point, but we have yet to identify the messenger. 
First, there's a relevant variant here in the perfectly preserved Quran. According to Abdul ibn Masud, it's not the dust of the footprint of the messenger, but it's the dust of the footprint of the messenger's horse. So several Muslim commentators then read this to be a reference to Gabriel's horse. We can actually trace how this developed as well with Muslim scholars borrowing from rabbinic tradition, no surprise. Regardless, Halperin reminds us that, in line with the Merkava context we've been exploring in this video, the Chayot are portrayed as messengers in Jewish tradition as well. So there's no need at all to depart from the Merkava context to explain the messenger. And finally, the phrase in Surah 2096, in this way my mind contrived it for me. Saul Lieberman points out that the second sentence reflects Song 612, it was my soul that induced me. We recall that this verse is the focus of all the medieval Jewish versions. The tale they tell, we now realize, must be older than the Middle Ages. We now see that all of these otherwise very obscure phrases in our two verses can be coherently explained when understood against the mystical context from which they derived. The calf mood because it was alive, having been detached from the Merkava, or having derived the essence of the Merkava ox from the magical dust of its footprints. I saw what they did not see comes from rabbinic exegesis of the Hebrew idiom ra'o ra'iti. The chayot are described as messengers in several rabbinic sources, and in this way my mind contrived it for me refers back to Song of Songs 612, a focus of rabbinic interpretation which describes God's regret at bringing this event upon himself. Think about these stories being told back in the 7th century in an oral culture. I'm sure they were fascinating. You could captivate your audience with stories about magical dust and footprints and a golden calf that mooed. It makes a great tale, but it doesn't make great scripture. This story, as we've seen, is entirely derived from esoteric exegesis. And wherever you put the Quran along the timeline of the development of these traditions, you have to admit once again, we find the Quran drinking deeply from the well of Jewish mysticism. And Muslims, when time and time again I trace these stories in the Quran back to their mystical roots, you can't tell me it's the word of Allah. I suggest you re-examine your doctrine of the Quran's divine origin in light of what I've presented in this video and elsewhere. I'll see you next time.